last time uh, when we were trying to argue, I think Salish uh, talked about that, yes, uh, that we have to think of theorization. And in that context, I think uh, methodology and epistemology becomes an uh, important aspect. And therefore, <clears throat> if you start with methodology and epistemology, theory becomes a very, very simple uh, way. So theorization will help you in that sense. So to begin with, I will uh, just explain uh, in uh, small little terms about what do I mean by methodology? And then what do I mean by epistemology? And then I will uh, club it and talk about that, uh, what is the significance of this topic? And what do we exactly gain? Okay, so beginning with this, that methodology is uh, explaining four very important uh, aspect of knowledge. And the first aspect of knowledge is that subject matter. What is the subject matter which we are going to engage with? So we will be dealing what Baba Sahib Ambedkar has produced as knowledge. So what is the subject matter of Baba Sahib Ambedkar? And how did he construct that subject matter? That is, uh, methodology also tells you how that subject matter is constituted. And third, uh, methodology tells you the usage of the concepts and procedures, the divine concepts and procedures through which we reach to knowledge. Now, third is the limits of the knowledge. And uh, within this methodology, there is another term called epistemology. And epistemology talks about the nature and scope of the knowledge. The nature and the scope of the knowledge. Second, what can be left with, what can be known with certainty, and what can be left to faith and opinion. That is uh, one part of the epistemology. The second part is what is the source and foundation of the knowledge? How do you? Usually there are two sources. One is empiricism, another is rationalism. That through sense perception, you can have knowledge. And second, you can rationalize and then you can have knowledge. But Immanuel Kant says that, no, you cannot have knowledge only through empiricism. You cannot have knowledge only through rationalism, but you have to combine the two. So knowledge is produced by combination of empiricism and rationalism. That is what I think Baba Sahib Ambedkar's writing and his speeches gives us. And last but not the least, the criteria to evolve and differentiate between scientific knowledge and non-scientific knowledge. So club to this, you know, four aspects of methodology and uh, epistemology will give you a little bit of theorization. That means theory is nothing but logical, logical connections of propositions out of which you can draw meaning. Logical connections of propositions out of which you can draw meanings. Also, you know, they give you the broader contours the framework to understand a phenomena. For example, reference group theory. So reference group theory gives you a framework. What is reference? What is actually group and through which you start understanding? You don't go out of the frame. So theory also gives you a framework, broader framework, in which you can uh, nip in the, you can nip in the bud the realities. Okay, you can, you can up, sub, subtract the reality into one particular idea, concept, or the broader notion. Conflict theory. So as soon as I say conflict theory, you will get lot of events which have been nip in the butt, that is conflict, and that becomes a theory. So if you have methodology, if you have epistemology in your hand, you can theorize a situation, okay? 
And that is why I think we need methodology and epistemology for any aspect of the thing to understand the reality. Okay. Having said this, you know, this, uh, this lecture, what I'm trying to suggest to you is, uh, is, is a really a long experiential uh, data for with me and at least two decades of engagement with Baba Sahib's writing and his speeches. But why at all I have tried to engage with this topic? I have tried to engage with this topic is because I found in academia, very few people engage Baba Sahib Ambedkar with academics. They try to only deal Baba Sahib Ambedkar as an activist, as a leader of the, of the Dalits, who has been raising the uh, who has been raising the voices of the marginal sections? That is what people will say that oh, he's a Dalit leader. That's all. Some people talk about yeah, they have started talking about that. Yes, he has contributed in the making of the constitution. But after that, if you ask what have you read, they will say yeah, yeah, I've read many things about Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Then which book you have read of Baba Sahib Ambedkar? They'll say, ah, I've read Annihilation of Caste. Or some people will say at least a origin of a mechanism, origin of caste in or caste in India, origin, mechanism, and spread. That's all. These are two very important uh, tracts uh, people read. And therefore, friends, I thought that, no, I think we have to academically engage Baba Sahib Ambedkar on very different plane. And that is why I have kept this topic of methodology and epistemology of Baba Sahib Ambedkar's thought and philosophy. Now, coming to the significance of the topic or the benefits and the significance, what benefit we are going to have by understanding methodology and epistemology of Baba Sahib Ambedkar's thought and philosophy. What will be the benefit? The first benefit which we will get is comprehensive framework to understand and analyze Baba Sahib's thought and philosophy. It will be a comprehensive framework. Second, we will come to know the logical sequencing of the production of knowledge about the issues, logical sequencing, how Baba Sahib Ambedkar has produced the knowledge. And third, nature and scope of his knowledge, how many issues which he has engaged with. And fourth, we will come to know about the source and the foundation of the knowledge, whether it is experiential reality or whether he is using some archival sources or how many sources he has used to build his knowledge. And fifth, we will also come to know about how many types of perspective in which he has produced his knowledge. What are the perspectives? And last but not the least, the social ecology. We will come to know about the social ecology in which he has produced knowledge. This actually is the benefit that we are going to understand about. Now coming to the, what is the significance? What is the significance of this methodology and epistemology of Baba Sahib's thought and philosophy? Now in that context, I will give you at least eight important significance, which may be actually related to benefits also, but I will give you eight type of significance which I am thinking that you can have. The first is that, you know, you will come to know the methodology and epistemology. That means nature is scope of Baba Sahib Ambedkar's production knowledge, concepts which he has used, theories he has used to understand the reality. And then you will also come to know that what type of theories he has used for defining his uh, relationship with the social structure and also social facts. 
Second, the sources. I will tell, let you know. Then second, signific second significance is how many types of socio-political religious issues he has. And I see that at least I have tried to uh, look at 10 socio-political resources, issues which he has raised in his production of knowledge. Third, by how many types? How many types of icons have influenced him? Iconography of influencing Baba Sahib Ambedkar. And fourth, how many types of formal and informal experiences have shaped his thought and philosophy? How many types of formal and informal experiences have shaped his thought and philosophy? And fifth, why is it necessary to understand biographical influences? Is there a theoretical and philosophical rationale that we should understand the influences of icons and personal experiences on the production of knowledge? Sixth, what are the exact sources, whether it is archival or whether it is archaeological, or whether encyclopedic, or it is book, newspaper clipping, what are the sources which he is using? And then, what is the time period, ecology, in which he was producing the knowledge? You will come to know the significance is that. And last but not the least, the perspective in which he has produced his knowledge. So these are few you know, significances. So we really have a very, very broad sequencing of the, you know, theorization of Baba Sahib Ambedkar's thought and philosophy. People only talk about annihilation of caste and leave him. Or they will at the most talk about origin of caste and leave it. And that I call a process of reductionism. A process of reductionism that reducing either Baba Sahib Ambedkar to analysis of caste or reducing him Baba Sahib Ambedkar to Dalit leadership. That is all actually we have seen. But that is not the way to engage with Baba Sahib Ambedkar. And therefore, friends, I think it's important to actually come with this framework. Now, coming to the exact aspect that, that since when we can begin Baba Sahib Ambedkar's academic production of knowledge, what is the exact date you assign for production of knowledge of Baba Sahib Ambedkar's you know, writing? And here, friends, when we talk about Baba Sahib Ambedkar's, when we are talking about Baba Sahib Ambedkar's production of knowledge, we are talking about Baba Sahib Ambedkar's production of knowledge in, uh, in formal, in formal occasions. We are not talking about, you know, as and when he was standing and he was wearing a kurta and pajama one day and he started speaking, that was knowledge. No. We are not talking about that knowledge. We are talking about that he produced empirical, theoretical, philosophical knowledge in on informal settings. That is in the university system. Universities, committees, and commissions assembly and state and national assemblies, national and state assemblies. And he delivered memorial lectures, written memorial lectures. And then he wrote referential books, books with references. And then he published 
articles in general, journal. So I am talking about here, when we talk about production of knowledge, we should remember we are not talking about his speeches here and there. We are talking about his speeches on formal occasions and formal settings. So most important, significant aspect of his knowledge is that he produced while he was interacting with, within these structures and processes. A formal structure is there, friends. You, it's not that actually, you know, whatever you spoke and that becomes knowledge. No, there is a proper paradigm of production of knowledge. Okay, that is one very important uh, underline I'm talking about. Now, if we, if we come to the date since when we should actually, when we should talk about uh, that since when Baba Sahib Ambedkar started producing the referential and official knowledge. So we can go back. We can go back to the first article or first presentation, which he did in 1916 in Columbia University. Uh, Columbia University, he gave, you know, his uh, lecture, of course, uh, in, uh, uh, and then that lecture was published in 1970. His first lecture was published in 1970s, and that was in Ant Indian Antiquary. That was the journal, and that was a foreign journal. So, you know, you can say that, sir, he wrote also his MA dissertation in 1915. So we can say that uh, the formal production of knowledge starts with MA dissertation in 1915 because his paper, I was saying that he started his production of knowledge from 1915. And then in 1916, he presented a paper and then uh, 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 from MA dissertation, he wants to come to present a, a seminar paper in 1916 and that too in uh, Golden Visor Seminar. And then 1917, that paper gets published in Indian Antiquary. And in 1918, he writes another paper in journal called Journal for Indian Economic Society. And then we can say that his uh, uh, dissertation, PhD dissertation, that is 1922. So we can say that Ambedkar started his formal production in 1915 and 1920s. 1990s, he also produces his first memorandum to Southborough community. That is also formal production of knowledge. So friends, actually, 19... 90s and 20 is the real time when Baba Sahib started producing referential knowledge on formal occasions. That I think we should underline and therefore don't reduce him only to caste, caste genesis, and elation of caste. I think there is much larger uh, you know, analysis is waiting for us. Now from here, let's come to epistemology of his thought. I have given you the date. Now I come to the epistemology of thought, you know. Now here, epistemology of thought, I want to begin with biography of Baba Sahib Ambedkar. And this analysis, I am drawing from uh, four, uh, four uh, two philosophers and uh, two theoreticians. I am drawing that because then and then only we can rationalize that why biographical uh, experiences are liable for academic interpretation. Why it is important. Okay. So biographical, biographical experiences can become 
the basis for academic analysis. So what is the rationale behind this? That is, I am trying to underline. Now this I have taken from René Descartes. Descartes says that I think, therefore I am. And therefore, with the experiential reality, people really think that they are started thinking. Before that, if they do not have experience, then actually they may be unconscious. But if they have started thinking, and Descartes also says that the differentiation between good reason and bad reason, individual has a capacity to differentiate between good reason and bad reason, and that is given by nature to every individual. And therefore, friends, Dalits can also think. They can differentiate between. Gatri Spivak says that, can subalterns speak? Some people say that, no, you know, Dalits, the scheduled caste or the Dalits, those who were not engaged in organic labor, they could not produce any knowledge. But here is Descartes saying that, you know, I think, therefore I am. And therefore, Dalits also think. They also rationalize good reason and bad reason. And therefore, experiential reality has an underpinning. Second person is a theoretician called C. Wright Mills. C. Wright Mill says that, you know, sociological imagination or imagination for individual, for the society has three coordinates. One is biography. One is biography. Second is history. And third is their interaction between biography and history. Biography, history, and their interaction in society are three coordinates for imagination of people to produce knowledge. Baba Sahib Ambedkar's personal experience, history, and their interaction in society becomes a very potent basis for production of knowledge, friends. And therefore, I'm saying that we need to engage with Baba Sahib Ambedkar's experience. How many types of experiences has he had? And this, I'm also talking about influence. Influence of Babas on Baba Sahib Ambedkar is also important experience. The third person, the third theoretician, which I'm taking help of is Peter Berger and Lockman. Sociology of knowledge. They tried to argue that sociology of knowledge teaches existential determination of thought. Existential determination of thought. That means individuals, individual have existential relationship with each other and that existence determines their thought. So the nature of existence has a bearing on the production of knowledge out of which they produce. Last but not the least, I take it from Paulo Freire, who tries to argue. You can add here also, in positive sense, you can add, you know, Bordi. Bordi talks about that some people are born with cultural capital, and therefore production of knowledge is based on their cultural capital. But certain people are deprived of cultural capital, and therefore their production of knowledge is based on deprivation of cultural capital. And therefore, friends, this Baba Sahib Ambedkar's production of knowledge should be seen that he was based, he was placed in the lowest of the social structure and he did not have cultural capital. He was devoid of that cultural capital and therefore his production of knowledge is paradigmatically different from the others. Last but not the least, I take it from Paulo Freire who says pedagogy of the oppressed will be written by oppressed only. Oppressor will not write an emancipatory agenda. And therefore, these five people give us a rationale to understand the production of Baba Sahib Ambedkar's knowledge. 
or you can say dalit literature also you can drag it that dalit literature can also have a rationale for production of knowledge it becomes a very very important sociological data because it is experiential it is existential determination of thought and it is because of the location of the social structure that all is very important therefore friends there is a enough academic rationale for treating baba sahab ambedkar's experience and experience as part of his production of knowledge his production of knowledge is shaped by these experiences never never ever think that no no there is actually no influence there is no rationale for understanding the influence of anyone in the production of knowledge experience doesn't determine i think that is what is wrong to argue and therefore i argue that baba sahab experiences have to be taken into consideration so to begin with baba sahab ambedkar you know people keep on telling me oh yaar he was actually this that but i begin that baba sahab ambedkar's first influence comes from buddha and we all know that how buddha buddha's actually influence is writ large not only in his comparison with karl marx and buddha but also actually his conversion to buddha and then his whole book buddha and his dhamma so we can have actually enough empirical evidences that how baba sahab ambedkar was influenced by even when baba sahab ambedkar was talking about actually defining when baba was baba sahab was talking about defining the uh, democracy in india he took lot of leaf from buddhism so there is one this influence of buddha second influence comes from kabir and uh, you know that kabir's uh, bhajans he heard in the very beginning and last but not the least his influence comes from jyotiba phule so i am not going into detail but i think we can think of where actually it comes where is it and how it is because he dedicates he dedicates his volume 7 who were the shudras and why they became so to uh, jyotiba phule where he writes that actually greatest shudra uh, for the revolution now coming to the other experiences i have tried to look at the nine type of personal experiences which baba sahab has undergone starting from his childhood experience of discrimination childhood experience of discrimination enlightened experience of the university in the western universities or universities on the west enlightened experiences of the universities of the western country experience of the working uh, working in the institutions in the institutions working in the institution during the british period as the member of vice rice council experience working as a member of the constituent the journal member and then he worked as the chairman of the drafting committee the uh, uh sixth experience working as a law minister of independent india and then experience as the down trodden leaders of the down trodden and experience as a social reformer of the down trodden and uh, then eighth experience as a political leader opponent to gandhi and congress and last but not the least a religious renouncer how he acts so these experiences have to be factored in if we really want to understand after that friends i come directly to baba sahib's direct experiences how many how many types of resources he has used what are the resources and i look at at least nine types of resources which baba sahib has used in the production of knowledge what are these resources oh. 
So to begin with, he begins with the archaeological resources. Archaeology as a resource, as the founding, archaeological sources. I'll, ar he uses archaeology as a source of the knowledge. Second, Indological sources, Indological sources that the book view, Vedas, Ismitis, Brahmanas, he uses that. Archaeological sources, Indological sources, archival sources. He uses archives as a source, archival material. The fourth, he uses government reports as sources. Government reports. The census report is different from government report I'm talking about. Census report is different. He uses census, fine. But friends, he uses six types of encyclopedia. Encyclopedia, I was reading his text. He has used six types of encyclopedia. So encyclopedic resources are different. Books and journals are okay, that is another source, but paper clippings, newspaper clippings as a source of knowledge. Then newspaper clippings as a source of knowledge. Then direct observation. Direct observation as the source of knowledge. I'm, I am actually just also including living lived experience and last but not the least that is people's perception his people's perception so we can see that how baba sahib has used multiple sources hum log jayenge we will go and we will we will observe and we will write a paper no that is not the way to write an academic paper that is not the way to actually produce the academic knowledge, friends. You have to have multiple sources where you can verify and re-verify. That is the way that Baba Sahib Ambedkar used, produced his knowledge. Hence, we can conclude that Baba Sahib Ambedkar was not writing and debating on hunches, on instincts, on hearsay. He did not produce knowledge from speculative philosophy. Rather, he produced empirical, observational, and objective knowledge in the formal occasions. That we have to understand about the epistemology of Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Now, coming to the approaches, how many approaches which Baba Sahib Ambedkar has used in his production of knowledge. It is not that Baba Zah was writing, you know, without any understanding of knowledge, you know. And where here, when I start evaluating, I found a deep positivist impact on Baba Zah Ambedkar's production of knowledge. Positivistic impact. And this positivist impact is nothing but coming from Newtonian physics model, which has said that if you can know the origin, you can know the final position. And therefore, friends, we see that there are actually very, very different sources. Second, there is the first approach Baba Sahib uses in his work is historical approach. He goes into the origin of the institution, whether it is origin of the caste, origin of untouchability, origin of the shudra, origin of the religion, so on and so forth. He goes into origin and therefore he uses a historical approach. Related to historical approach is a evolutionary approach. A evolutionary approach where Things become from simple to complex. And this evolutionary model, evolutionary model comes from Charles Darwin. How from one aspect actually starts with simplicity or simplic aspect goes into the 
uh, it goes into complexity. And that is where we see that how Baba Sahib Ambedkar is producing knowledge. The third perspective, which is actually coming from Indian perspective, I call is Indological perspective, where Baba Sahib uses Indological texts. That means that is book view of Indian society, how he produces the Varna model, a social structure given by Manu, and no sociologist has given the way he has tried to. Even the status of the women which he tries to understand through uh, Atharveda, uh, through actually, you know, Ashtadayi, Patanjali, and then also, you know, Kautilya, Arthashastra, it is very, very fascinating that he's using Indological sources to understand the Indian society. Last but not the least, uh, fourth uh, a perspective which he uses is comparative approach. He uses comparative perspective in the production of knowledge. Whether he was trying to understand the Indian revolution, he tried to compare different types of revolution, Puritan's revolution, French revolution, Japanese revolution, and Indian revolution. Whether he was trying to understand the difference between, try to differentiate between the two, and then he comes to. So I was saying that he uses a uh, comparative perspective in the production of knowledge. And production of knowledge in comparative perspective, that means he tries to compare. Actually, when he was trying to talk about revolution, he compares social revolution with political revolution. And he argues that how social revolution is preceded by, uh, political revolution is always preceded by uh, this, actually, the, this whole, you know, this whole uh, political revolution is always pre preceded by social revolution. So he's trying to compare with social revolution with political revolution. And then he goes on to compare social revolution and political revolution in different epochs, starting from uh, Puritans uh, in Europe to Arabs and in India with actually Buddha's revolution and then Maurya's uh, access into power. Then he tries to also compare French revolution with Japanese revolution and Indian revolution. What is happening here? He, when he tries to compare with uh, untouchability, with untouchability, with uh, uh, slavery, he tries to differentiate between American slavery and European slavery. And then, friends, he comes to India. So in that say that we have a comparative perspective as well. Now, you know, by doing this, with this multiple approach, you know, we can see that how Baba Sahib Ambedkar has tried to engage with nature and scope of the knowledge. What is the nature and scope of the knowledge? And I try to look at least 10 shades of that, starting from social, political, economic, religious, educational, constitutional, gender, developmental, and uh, emancipation of the Dalits and the thought on different societies of the world. This is the rubric. And within social, then actually people only restrict him to caste. But friend, that is not the case. You can see that if he start, if you really want to understand social, I will take only one example because there are 10. I cannot complete it, but I will stop only with this one. The first one is, if you really want to understand social, then you have to start with the individual in the social. That is one. And, um, and he tries to, and he tries to talk about that. How, how Ambedkar tries to understand a open social order. What is a open social order? 
what are the characteristics of open social order and within that he tries to locate what is the what is the individual how do you will place the individual what is the role of the individual and then second what are the characteristics of a open social order whether indian society is a social order or not then he goes on to understand the social structure what is the structure and within a structure no sociologist has done the way he has tries to analyze the hindu social structure friends i think we have to look at the social structure if you really want to understand how he looks at the social structure i'll just give you one example and stop this social structure he is trying to understand the first actually the first uh, uh sorry the first group which ambedkar brings in from manu he tries to say that manu tries to divide social structure first in that he is not using hindu social order he is using uh, indo aryan society talks about that actually uh, hindu uh, he is not using hindu social order he is using indo aryan society nobody uses that friend he is using indo aryan society indo aryan society is divided first into two broad categories one is vaidika v a i d i k vaidika and another is dasyu the second actually he says that the vaidika are themselves divided into four groups vaidika one is those inside the chaturvarna second those outside the chaturvarna turvarna means patit means outside the fold of the social order but then actually within the within those people who are outside the chaturvarna they are further divided into anuloma and pratiloma anuloma are those whose fathers are higher caste and mothers are for lower caste and pratiloma are those whose fathers are lower caste and mothers are higher caste this is the way that he tries to understand hindu social order or social structure then he comes to varna and he talks about four types of varna but he says that please don't take varna model only a very simple division rather there are there are really great complexities what are the complexity what are the complexities you know that you have to understand and this complexity he says that how instead of only simple division it is basically graded inequality and how the fourth model that is vaishya vaishya has become uh, for shudra has become the fourth varna that is one great revolution and it is not being done by rigveda rather it is being done by atharveda as well and therefore friends this is another leap and here you can also talk about actually that how baba saheb ambedkar from hindu social order hindu social structure comes to then he goes to caste genesis of caste and then he goes to untouchability that is the framework that we can understand the social order otherwise we will not be able to okay so i think there is a sequencing uh, i have taken too much of time but i could only complete this too much i can leave actually there are number of things that we can really talk about but we cannot actually complete all in one lecture so i was just saying that actually that baba saheb ambedkar as uh, you know uh, when he was talking about the social structure he say, uses the term uh, indo aryan society and within that he talks about that there are four very important uh, you know typologies that we have to talk about the first is actually vaidika v a i d i k a vaidika and dasyu and then vaidika is further divided into four groups 
those who are inside the chaturvarna and those who are outside the chaturvarna third the vratya and fourth are patit patits are outside outcast that is you know another uh, typology and then within those people who are outside the chaturvarna there are two groups further that is anuloma and pratiloma anuloma are those whose mothers are of lower caste and father are actually upper caste and then pratiloma those actually mothers are higher caste and the fathers are lower caste that is actually 